Hello, everyone, and welcome to CECON. This is the uh, Leadership and Strategy track. I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Simon Wardley back uh, again. From uh, he, he presented last year. If anyone hasn't seen that, go to my CECON channel on YouTube. It's, it was an amazing talk. And, uh, yeah, uh, Simon's uh, g uh, gladly uh, coming back to, to talk to you again and talk about ma mapping and mapping in the new normal. So thanks a lot, Simon. Over to you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, absolute delight to be here again. Thank you ever so much for uh, inviting me. OK, we've got a short amount of time and as per normal, far too much stuff to go through. So I'm going to uh, uh, start by, first of all, sharing a screen. Hang on a second. Du, du, du. Hopefully uh, you can all see that. And uh, so I better get started. It, it, right. So mapping. OK, well, what, what I'm going to talk about is the origin of mapping. Uh, and then we're going to get into uh, its use. And then I'm going to talk about some of the new norms. So the origin of mapping is here. It's, uh, it's me as the fake CEO. I was running a company. I hadn't got a clue what I was doing, uh, but we were profitable. Uh, revenue was gr growing, but, you know, I was clueless. And so I was worried that everybody would eventually rumble that I was clueless, uh, despite the fact that I used to write all these wonderful vision statements and everything else. I, I would have things like this. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, this was uh, back in 2003. It was great, except for I'd simply copied it from another company and changed a few words. Anyway, so I was a bit worried that people would rumble. So I went around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. And I used to record the short words they used. And I called them business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blast for short. And I've done this every couple of years. And these were the common blasts from 2014. Digital business, uh, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, blah, blah, blah. And then what I did was I grabbed lots of companies' vision statements and strategy documents and things like that and smashed them together and created what I called the blah template. So our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I simply smashed the blahs and the blah templates together and auto-generated 64 random strategies. And I've done this many, many times. So the last time I did this, I had 64, uh, things like this. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. And so I sent it around. I got about 400 responses of three basic types. The first being, this is the exact wording from our business plan. The second being, I've seen two of these used already. And the third being, are oh, you for hire? So... Not only was I making it up, I was coming to the sneaking suspicion that so was everybody else. Anyway, this is all uh, Creative Commons. Uh, a friend of mine's put this online, uh, Strashy Mad Libs. Uh, if you just type the URL, it will automatically generate you a strategy based upon nothing whatsoever. If you want to pretend it's got some advanced AI blockchain or consultant behind it, go ahead. Uh, but it's simply just smashing words into templates. And if you know our strategy is collaborative, we will lead an open effort of the market through our use of big data and social media to build a digital business. Well, that sounds exciting. Uh, if you don't like it, simply just press refresh. It'll create your new one. Anyway, so I was there thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm making money. I'm not sure everybody else knows what I'm doing. Help. And I read every book I could find on strategy got nowhere. And so I was in this bookshop. Uh, going to buy the latest new books on how to do things on strategy, whatever. And the bookseller said, had you read Sun Tzu? And I went, no. And they said, you should buy two copies because they were very clever. And uh, so they got me to buy two different copies. And the good thing is they're translations. And so they're both different. And in the reading of the second one, I noticed something. When Sun Tzu talked about strategy, he talked about five factors that mattered in competition. One, have a purpose. Two, understand your landscape. Three, understand the climactic patterns changing your landscape. Four, understand doctrines, uh, principles of uh, orientation, you know, uh, how you how you organize yourself. And finally, you get into the leadership bit, which is all about gameplay and, and where you take action. And then I came across John Boyd. And John Boyd created something called the OODA loop. 
So you've got the game, your purpose. The first O of the OODA loop is to observe the environment. And that's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. And then you orientate yourself around this with doctrine, and then you decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And it's a cycle. And the more you go around the cycle, the better you get at this game. Now, there are two whys at the heart of the cycle, the why of purpose, my moral imperative, and the why of movement. Why do I make this choice over that choice? Now, in order for this to work, you've obviously got to understand the landscape. And so I took an interest in, in landscape and mapping and things like that. And I started going back through all these old military books, and it took me back to things like the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem the Persians were invading. And so what they decided to do, or what he decided to do, was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road uh, into a narrow pass where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Now, there are about 170,000, roughly, uh, Persians. There are about 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. And that's where we get the story of the 300 from. Now, I thought, right, well, how do I do this in business? And I thought, well, I'm, I'm uh, uh, why? sorry about this. I tend to use SWATs. Um, so I decided to write a SWAT for Themistocles. So the strength, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the e might stop the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Uh, the opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the, uh, the, the Spartans. We're Athenian. We actually hate the uh, Spartans. And the threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So I thought, well, what would you use to communicate determined strategy in battle? Position and movement described by Matt or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram. And I thought, gosh, I'm using SWOT diagrams. And I thought, what I need to do is use a map. And then I started to look around. I thought, well, maps, we must have maps. And we had loads of maps, my maps, um, business process maps, uh, systems maps. We had maps everywhere. But if I took one of these maps and I took like CRM on my systems map and I move that box and maybe put it under compute, how does the map change? And the answer is it doesn't. It doesn't change because it's not a map. It's a graph. If you take a, a geographical map of the world and move Australia and put it next to England, of course, the map has changed, but not in this case. And that's because it's a graph. So better explain the difference between graphs and maps, because unfortunately, everything pretty much that we call map in business is actually a graph. The three diagrams at the top are actually graphs and they're all identical. And the three diagrams at the bottom are actually maps and they're all different. And the fundamental difference between a map and a graph is that in a map, space has meaning. So if you move components in a map, it changes the meaning of the map, which is why it's good for exploring space, whether physical or competitive. Now, where does that property and magic characteristic come from? Three characteristics define it. First, you need an anchor, so magnetic north in the case of geographical maps. You need position of pieces relative to the anchor. So this is north, south, east, or west of that. And then, so Nottingham is, is north and slightly west of uh, London. And then you need consistency of movement. So if I'm going from London to Dover, uh, I, I'm going south and I'm going west or southwest. Um, and that movement, that direction is consistent. It's not like I go south, but I'm actually heading north. So what I decided to do was create a map of something simple. I started with a tea shop. I need an anchor. So I had public and business because they're the users. I also have regulators and others, so I can add as many anchors as I like. And I thought, well, what do they need? And they went, ah, oh, cup of tea. Public wants to drink cups of tea uh, and business needs to sell cups of tea. So we've got a common need here. And it turns out that cup of tea also has needs. It needs tea, it needs cup, it needs hot water. Hot water needs cold water, it needs a kettle, kettle needs power. So what I can do is I can create a chain of needs. Now I've got anchor and position in a chain of needs. I'm still missing movement. And it turned out um, after spending six months uh, doing, collecting far too much uh, data and having a lot of accidents along the way, that there's a common pattern by which things evolve. 
You start off with the genesis of the novel and new custom built examples, products and rental services, and eventually commodity and utility services. So now I can map it because what I've got is an anchor. I've got position in my chain of needs and I've got movement uh, described by the evolution axis. Now I can show this to somebody else and, and they can sort of challenge my assumptions. They might say I'm missing bits like staff. Uh, and in fact, staff have become more, more commodity. Uh, so we should be using robots. I might disagree with them. Um, we can also, because these are maps of capital and the flow of capital, we can actually put values to it from this great p &Ls. And then somebody can say, oh, why are we using custom built kettles? Why are we using standard kettles? And somebody might come in and say, oh, it's brand exclusivity. And what we can do is we can have a discussion about this space. Now that is critically important. A lot of businesses, and certainly my business at the time, uh, were, uh, are run by stories. And one of the problems with stories is that you have a storyteller. We spend a lot of time telling people uh, that uh, uh, your idea failed because you didn't sell the, tell the story in the right way. But by emphasizing this, we politicize the story to the person, which is why when somebody has a story and you go and say, I think you're wrong, you're challenging them. Ah, oh. But if you put a, the story on a map, I can go to a map and say, I think the map is wrong. I'm no longer challenging you. I'm challenging the map. It's the map at fault. It's its representation is wrong. And this is quite a powerful idea. So this brings me on to use. So I'll just give you a couple of examples because there's, there's a lot of examples of the use of this form of mapping in different areas. And this is a huge field and we've got a very short time to go through it. So this is from an insurance company. This is their process flow that they have. They need to compute, order, server. Server goes into goods in, then modify, mount it, rack it. And they had a bottleneck around modification and mounting of service. Now I'm sticking with the tech sphere. A lot of my stuff is at nation state. Uh, some of it's in culture, some of it's in political systems, but I'm gonna stick within at the tech sphere. Now they had a bottleneck uh, to do with the modification and mounting a service. And they'd spent six months working on a, uh, a case uh, for investing in, in robotics. And, and so they had this wonderful story with return investment, all the sort of uh, um, uh, various uh, business cases put together and justifications for why this was a good thing. And none of these people were daft. They're all very smart people. So I can't challenge the story without challenging them. So I said, could we simply map it? It took them about 15 minutes, and this is what they did. They went, user needs compute, compute needs order server, server goods in. That's all sort of more commodity stuff. I, I would disagree with them, compute as a product. I would say it's more commodity, but that's okay. And then they went, rack, mount, modify. Now, I was simply able to go, why have you put rack in custom build? And they went, oh, we have custom built racks. Ah. And they said, that's why uh, we need to modify service, because when we buy service, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get the servers to fit our racks. And that's why we need robotics. And of course, you could see it in the, in the group that somebody just went, hang on, why are we using standard racks? Then we wouldn't need any of this stuff. But ah, it wasn't that these people were daft, that people were trapped by context. And this is one of the most common problems that I see. Uh, people focusing on what we call process flow. So making the existing system more and more optimal, where in fact they should be first focusing on evolutionary flow, i.e. taking what is custom, making it more commodity. We spend huge sums of money making the highly, um, let's, say, let's say, ineffective, uh, more efficient. Uh, it's, it's better to start with making the ineffective more actually effective. Yeah. And I, I mean, I do stuff in m and and you, you, you see companies who, um, it all looks perfectly reasonable, but once you map the landscape, what is actually being done? actually makes no sense. I mean, they're heading over a cliff. It, it, it's, and it's not that these people are daft. It's just literally they are trapped by context. So another example I'll give, uh, I'll sit with heavy engineering this time, is HS2, High Speed Rail. So this is James Finley. And what we decide, uh, James decided to do was build the entire of HS2 in a virtual world. This is back in 2012, 2013, because it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we got that wrong, than it is to dig up the English countryside. So he started off with a systems diagram and he had the usual sort of purchasing problem of, you know, what do I outsource? Um, 
Uh, should I outsource the whole lot? Should I try and build it? Should I buy off the shelf products? Well, in this simple diagram, there's 360 million possible permutations of that question. So he was like, what should I do? So um, one of the things we've learned from mapping is that there's no such thing as one size fits all methods in terms of uh, whether it's purchasing or whether it's project management. So things like Agile are very strong on the left-hand side of the map, which what we call the uncharted space, where things are very chaotic, whereas Six Sigma and outsourcing are very strong on the right-hand side. And in the middle, there's a method called Lean, which is all about focused on learning and reducing waste, which works better. So Agile is good at reducing the cost of change. Six Sigma is good at reducing deviation and Lean's good at learning. And so what James did was simply draw out his systems diagram as a map, putting things where they were, sent it to me, and this was 2012, and we had a discussion, and now it becomes easy. We just overlay that, that particular pattern. And we go, right, all the stuff on the right-hand side, we need to outsource. All the stuff in the middle, off-the-shelf products, all the stuff on the left, we're going to build agile in-house techniques. Eventually, this project ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee because it was delivered uh, ahead of schedule, and under budget, which is pretty pretty unusual uh, for, for some government projects. And the reason why it's unusual is what we tend to do is outsource the whole lot. We don't have a map, and it just seems like, oh, we'll, we'll get somebody else to build it for us. And that outsourcing the whole lot requires a contract. So we try and specify it. And the problem here is the stuff on the right can be specified. And so this stuff will be efficiently treated, but the stuff on the left we can't even specify. We never can. And so it's always going to incur excessive change control costs. And you, you can tell this with projects before you've even started by simply mapping it out and overlaying contract structures. You can see the bits which are going to fail before we've even started. So I give an example, another example of this, uh, which is uh, the emergency services mobile communication platform. That's critical uh, uh, communication for uh, um, uh, things like police and fire, etc. Um, when I first met this group, the first thing I asked is, "What's the user need?" Because that's one of the key anchors, and people just pointed to a great big specification document. So I just sat down with them. It just took an afternoon. And they mapped it out, starting with the user. What do we need? A point to point communication, job dispatch, all those sorts of things. And underneath this is a mass of different components. Now, now we've mapped it out. So I, 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 I can actually, I think I can draw. Hang on a second. Oh, oh don't worry. I, I can't draw on this particular map. Um, so if I look at uh, this particular map, if I was going to bundle it all in one contract, then of course the bits on the left-hand side is where I'm going to incur all the excessive change to control costs. So what I need to do is subdivide it. But when I subdivide this into, con uh, into lots, for example, I've got to be very careful to make sure I take all the similar bits, which are commodity-like, and bundle those together because I can specify them. But all the bits which are much more bespoke, I need a different approach. Now, unfortunately, the, the contract structure wasn't that way. It spread you know, horizontally across the lot. And, and for whatever reason, they decided not to change it. But um, I mean, there, there's been a few issues, um, but there was other learning which came from this. Because one of the beauties about maps is you can share it with others. So you can share your map with the, uh, in this case, with borders, police, immigration. And then by you looking at the maps that they have, you can compare and discover we have duplication and bias within systems. And, and, and this is a big problem. So well, actually, they're all big problems. So what this is a profile diagram taken from several maps uh, is a somewhat simplified, identifying how many times we've rebuilt the same thing. Now, often people think, oh, well, government's really bad at this sort of stuff. Uh, actually, not at all. Um, the worst I've got in government is 118 workflow systems doing exactly the same thing. We've managed to build prisoner registration 118 different ways. That is nothing compared to the private sector. I've got a pharma company with 350 teams building enterprise content management systems and five global efforts to build the global enterprise, manage, uh, 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 enterprise content management system, none of which knows the others exist. Uh, the worst of the lot, I've got a bank who've managed to build risk management over 
over a thousand different ways. So I, I know everybody complains about government and oh, it's wasteful and blah. Oh, no, no. If you want waste, if you want duplication, if you want bias, if you want using the wrong methods in the wrong places, the private sector has you be. Anyway. Maps, of course, are imperfect representations of the space. This is a map of France. It's not a perfect map of France, um, but it's still useful. In fact, if it was a perfect map of France, it would be one-to-one -one scale, which means it would be the size of France. It would therefore be France. And as a map, that's pretty useful. All maps are imperfect representations, which is why they are good for challenging things. And challenging is what we do a lot of. So this is Liam Maxwell, a good friend of mine. I, I wrote something called the Better for Less paper with Liam, helped transform UK government, leading to things like spend control. Um, this is one project alone, which they've saved, what, 425 million, expecting 1.5 billion in lifetime. If you were talk, listening to Mark Craddock, who was speaking at Map Camp recently, uh, some of the mapping stuff they've done has saved about 12 billion. If you were listening to Jackie Taylor, who's worked with the UN and various other organizations, I mean, they they're talk about maps, which, which have a total area of impact, potentially of around 132 trillion. So, so <laughs> which are like ridiculously huge numbers, which make my head go bang. But anyway, um, my favorite are things like this. This is uh, RNLI. Uh, this is uh, James Finley. Use mapping within there to improve communication times, which actually saves lives because the boats actually, if you fall in the Thames, um, the, the communication speed is such now that the chances are a boat will pick you up. I'm not recommending falling in the Thames, by the way. Um, but uh, fabulous stuff uh, by James. Uh, and I mentioned the UN. This is uh, from uh, Chikati. This is the UN uh, Global Platform and Information Technology Strategy. It's going out to 192 countries being translated. You'll find uh, the entire strategy section, IT section, is all maps. Uh, there's a lot of mapping stuff going on. And particularly why it's interesting is because you can have very high level to low level maps. So you can go from a, a mission of reducing global poverty down through the components to the necessity of all weather roads, all the way down into the national statistics organizations and the survey systems that they actually use. And of course we find duplication and ways of improving things. It's also used for organizational structure, how to organize yourself around a space. I won't go into that now, just a big shout out for to GCHQ uh, for Boiling Frogs. Uh, wonderful, it's, it's completely uh, open document, help yourself to it. Uh, it talks about how to organize for uh, an environment which is constantly changing and highly disruptive. Um, even uh, people like Amazon, uh, AWS's second ever book has about 20, 30 pages of mapping in there. Really recommend reading that book, Region Cloud, Cloud Velocity, and of course the Art of Strategy um, has come out and that's, that's got a lot of more my maps in there as well. Okay, so I've talked about origin. I've talked a bit about use. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. Oh, I think I've got enough time. I'm gonna get into some new norms. And to explain this, I'm going to use climatic patterns. There are three basic types of patterns. These are climatic, which uh, you don't have a choice. They just change a the landscape. There are doctrine, which you do have choice, but the doctrine are universally useful. So climatic patterns are things like things will evolve. Universally useful patterns are focus on user needs. And then there's the gameplay, um, uh, which are context specific. There's about 110 gameplay, about 40 doctrine, and about 30 climatic patterns. So we haven't got a hope of going through through this all, but I'm going to mention a few. So this is a typical computing stack from the user, application, best coding practice, runtime, operating system, best architectural practice to compute. One of the patterns you learn is that everything evolves. Doesn't matter what it is, eventually compute was going to become a utility. The next pattern you learn is that we have inertia to past success, because of past success. So we have inertia to change. Um, as things change, uh, efficiency enables innovation. So as it becomes more utility, it enables the appearance of new things and new patterns to appear. So you often get new emerging practices as well. And this also enables the creation of new higher order systems of worth and value. So things like as electricity became a utility, we got things like computing, we got the radio, we got electric lights. This is great because this also tells me where to invest. Because obviously, if, if I've got my line of the present, I can see where it's changing. It tells me where to go. It also tells me where not to go. 
I don't invest in the stuff stuck behind inertia barriers. One of the interesting things about um, Netflix and Blockbuster is, is Blockbuster was first with a um, video ordering online, first with a website, first with video streaming, but it went under, um, even though it was first. So it out-innovated everyone, but it went under. And it, the problem was past success at the shops. Uh, created a notion of the change. Anyway, so this tells me where not to invest, like the robots. Don't spend the money on robots, better things to do. And I use this at a place called uh, Canonical, Ubuntu. Uh, so uh, we were about 3% of the operating system market against Red Hat Microsoft. Uh, we used the maps to map out the space. This was back in 2008, 2010. Uh, I spent half a million. It took 18 months. We took 70% of all cloud computing, which is why if you do anything on cloud, you've almost certainly heard of Ubuntu because most things are built with Ubuntu. Now that emerging practice evolved. It became DevOps. Uh, we gave it a name. Today, the runtime is evolving. Uh, it's becoming serverless. This is things like Lambdas. And that's creating a new set of emerging practice uh, and new needs are being created as well. So new things are being built on top of it. And that's all fairly standard which is where you should invest, serverless and those new practices, et cetera, and everything else is legacy, including DevOps, including old, you know, so I, I had these wonderful companies running around saying, we're going to go get cloud infrastructure as service and start our DevOps journey. That was great if it's 2010, but it's 2020. And that journey is going to take you seven years. And by the time you've got there, you'll have built the new legacy. So not the best move to be making at this moment in time. Uh, so that's the other thing, strategy is iterative. So what was a good idea back then is not a good idea now. Now, this is a very, very common pattern. So the user has some need for a higher thing, best practice built upon something. That thing evolves, creates a new set of practice and new needs. And it's happened throughout history. Agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, age of steam have all started with points of industrialization, creating new practices and new needs. And sometimes you have a forcing function for this change. So in New York City, turn of the uh, 20th century, in the 1900s, this is a picture of the street of New York City. Those are mountains of manure on the side because there were so many horses. And the manure, uh, you, there were public uh, um, committees about this, uh, created a forcing function for change, which is why you had a rapid adoption of uh, the motor car. And today we have a forcing function. It's called COVID. And that forcing function is for physical isolation, which is why what we're seeing is not the development of new things as much as the adoption of pre-existing technology. That has rapidly accelerated because of this forcing function. And there's no place better to see this than in conferences, which are all going virtual. The user wants to go to an event and used to rely on a physical space. What's happened is that uh, physical space has gone virtual. So we're starting to see new emerging practices and new needs. Um, now, of course, in the physical space, we had that need for that social interaction. Well, the isolation economy, well, not social isolation, but physical isolation caused by COVID is causing that, that acceleration of that change. So if you're a business providing conferences, now you've got a problem now. Unfortunately, there's a lot of businesses out there who somehow think, well, you know, this is only a temporary thing. Once it's over, we're going back to how it was. I'm afraid not. Once you start getting those new emerging practices, then those new needs, the new way, the new norm starts to stabilize. And so that's where you should be focused. How do I create social interaction in a virtual world? What are those new emerging practices? What are those new needs? And that's where my research these days, I'm looking at this with a team of about 70 people around the world at what those new emerging practices will be. And by the way, this is not new stuff. It happens every time we have one of these changes and it leads to new forms of organization. Industrial revolution, we got a set, a set of practices which created the American system of engineering. It's, it's just a common repeating pattern. So that was it, origin of mapping, how to use it, and the new norms. And at that point, I'm going to say thank you.